What's good with the YouTube of Convex Perspective? It's your boy, Big Flacco, as always, sliding through, smashing and dashing, man. Coming through with that little bit of energy in my coast, Big Senor Ro. Let's get it cracking, man. What we're going to be discussing today, man, is about a group out there in Tejas that's very active with that action, man. The Barrio Azteca. I'm going to let Rojo take it from there, and then we're going to give you guys a Convex Perspective as well as a little bit of information that we may have about this group. Bam. All right, man. This is from an unknown author. Barrio Azteca is one of the most violent prison gangs in the United States. The gang is highly structured and has an estimated membership of roughly 2,000. Most members are Mexican nationals or Mexican American males. Barrio Azteca is most active in the southwestern region, primarily in federal, state, and local corrections facilities in Texas, and outside of prison in southwestern Texas and southeastern New Mexico. The gang's main source of income is the derived from smuggling heroin, powder, cocaine, methamphetamines, and marijuana from Mexico in the United States for distribution both in and out of prison. Gang members often transport illicit drugs across the U.S.-Mexico border for DTOs, drug trafficking organizations. Barrio Azteca members are also involved in alien smuggling, arson, assault, auto theft, burglary, extortion, intimidation, kidnapping, robbery, and weapons violations. The Barrio Azteca was founded in 1986 by gang members Benito Benny Acosta, Albert Indio Estrada, Benjamin Tita Alvarez, Manuel Tolón Cardoza, Manuel El Grande Fernandez, Raul Rabio Fierro, and Jose Gitano Ledesma. The gang succeeded in attracting thousands of violent offenders who hated the Mexican MA as well as the Texas Syndicate. The Barrio Azteca's primary goal was to dominate the prison system and gain control of its lucrative drug trade. Members of this ruthless prison gang are all Hispanic and most are from El Paso, West Texas, and Northern Mexico. The gang has grown to become one of the nation's most dangerous prison gangs and is currently on the FBI and DEA's number one level threat assessment list. Following their emergence into the prison gang scene, both the Texas Syndicate and Mexican Mafia refused to recognize the Aztecs and declared war with that gang. They outnumbered the Aztecas. The outnumbered Aztecas struggled to battle their numerous enemies, but somehow managed to prevail by murdering several members of the Texas Syndicate in prisons and jails all over the state of Texas. Barrio Azteca earned the respect of the Texas Syndicate and Mexican Mafia and a peace treaty was signed on July of 1997. The Aztecas have multiplied and now outnumbered the Texas Syndicate. The highly organized prison gang currently operates both in state and federal prisons all over the United States as well as Mexico. The symbols of this group are the numbers 915, EPT, 21, BA, as well as Azteca themed tattoos. The territory includes El Paso, Juarez, Midland, Odessa, Las Cruces, New Mexico, as well as small chapters across the United States and Northern Mexican state of Chihuahua. The alliances, the strong one is the Juarez cartel. Membership, like previously mentioned, is roughly 2000. Ethnicity is Hispanic. In 1987, Barrio Azteca members murdered a Raza Unida prospect. This individual this, the group did not retaliate after the attack of this vigil and validated the attack after it was discovered that the victim was a former associate of the Barrio Azteca. In 1988, the Mexican MA instigated a war with the Barrio Azteca at the Coalfield Unit. A major statewide battle between the two prison gangs claimed the lives of two inmates. In 1993, the Barrio Azteca brutally beat and murdered a Texas Syndicate member in the El Paso County Jail causing the Texas Syndicate to align itself with the Mexican MA. Both the Texas Syndicate and Mexican MA teamed up against the Barrio Azteca. In 1994, Barrio Azteca murders, members murder a Texas Syndicate member at the Wallace Unit in Colorado City, Texas. 1995, Barrio Azteca stopped the grow up of an up and coming prison gang called the West Texas Carnales. In April of 1996, Barrio Azteca members murder a former Mexican Mafia member by strangling to death in the El Paso County Jail. In June of 1997, 
the Mexican inmate and Texas syndicate, settle a truce and sign a peace agreement called the Manifesto. Manifesto. Okay. Excuse me. No, I'm just repeating that. I remember. I remember hearing about the Manifesto. That's like a like a historical, political, Major prison Street politic Texas. issue that occurred. The gangs agreed to revise the Manifesto each year on May 5th. In 1998, members of the PRM, Partido Revolucionario Mexicano, assist the Tijuana, Mexico-based Border Brothers gang in a riot against the Aztecs in a federal penitentiary. Tensions erupt and both gangs attempt to settle the dispute. In 1999, Members of the PRM, the same as the aforementioned, attack a member of the Barrio Azteca at the Terro Unit in Livingston, Texas. The Aztecs retaliate by murdering three RPM rivals and injuring several in prison statewide. In 2000, a PRM member is murdered by Aztecas at the Cerizo Prison in Juarez. On late two, in late 2000, Azteca Captain Alberto Indio Estrada is released from prison after spending 17 years locked up. He deserts the gang and steals funds belonging to the organization. Manuel El Grande Fernandez replaces Estrada as the leader. In 2001, both the Tango Blast and Barrio Azteca gang engage in a gang fight in a gymnasium at the Torres State Prison in Hondo, Texas. Both gangs settle the truth soon thereafter. January of 2002, members of the Body of Azteca brutally stab a Tango Blast member while victim is using the restroom at the Robertson State Prison in Abilene, Texas. A gang war between the two gangs erupts again statewide right afterwards. June of 2002, the Tango Blast retaliates against the Body of Azteca by severely beating four of its members in the John B. Connolly State Prison in Kennedy, Texas. 2003, Barrio Azteca and what is drug cartel form an alliance and together both gangs vow to eliminate every PRM member in Northern Mexico. July of 2003, the Barrio Azteca declares war on the New Mexico Sindicato over a drug and territory dispute in Southern New Mexico. In 2004, the Sinaloa Drug Cartel and Juarez Cartel form alliances and create a federation between the two. The Barrio Azteca is included and carries out executions for the federation. In early 2005, Barrio Azteca members brutally murder a member of the rival Border Brothers gang in Mexico's Cerizo prison. February of 2005, the Aztecas pay Cerizo guards to supply the gang with hammers and shields. The Aztecas then break down a wall that separates the Azteca majority with the PRM minority. Six members of the PRM are brutally murdered by the Aztecas. In August of 2005, Barrio Azteca member Chato Flores is kidnapped and murdered by fellow Azteca members for stealing millions of dollars from the Juarez cartel. January 05, officials of the city of El Paso enforce an injunction on the Barrio Azteca in an effort to stop narcotics dealing on the streets. June of 2006, 29-year-old ex-Barrio Azteca member David Fonseca Jr. is brutally murdered in a parking lot by members of his prison gang. 2006, the Aztecas experience a power struggle between leaders and eight members of the gang are murdered by fellow members. October of 06, Phyllis Wadal, the owner of a strip club, Naked Harem, is arrested and charged with operating a prostitution ring with the Barrio Aztecas. Wadal is sentenced to 16 years in prison. In 2007, federal public defender Sandy Baez, 58, is arrested after FBI agents discover phone recordings of alleged gang leaders in prison conducting criminal transactions with Sandy Baez. May of 2007, Johnny Cornejo Micheletti, a former Azteca gang member, reveals crucial gang intelligence to the FBI. The information is used to indict several of the gang's leaders. As a result, dozens of ranking members of the Barrio Azteca are arrested and charged under RICO, the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organization Act, and sentenced to federal prison. Ranking members indicted and convicted are gang captains Carlos Padilla, Manuel Cordoza, Benjamin Alvarez, Francisco Herrera, Eugene Mona, and Arturo Enriquez. In April of 2018, Barrio Azteca leader David Chicho 
Maraz, 49, is found slain in Juarez. Juarez was in the gang's Juarez Capo was murdered by fellow Azteca members. March 2009, dozens of members of the Barrio Azteca murdered 20 RPM prison gang rivals at the Cerizo State Prison in Chihuahua, Mexico. May of 18, 2009, Barrio Azteca members are arrested by the FBI for cocaine dealing, including Azteca gang captain Gualberto Bird. September of 2009, 18 Barrio Azteca members gunned down in a Juarez rehab. Wow. The Barrio Azteca is one of the most violent prison gangs operating within the U.S. Most members are Mexican nationals and Mexican American. They're known for their extensive tattoos. And then uh, this is from, uh, this happened in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. A cross-border drug gang born in prison cells of Texas has evolved into a sophisticated paramilitary killing machine. U.S. and Mexican officials suspect is responsible for thousands of assassinations here including the recent ambush and slaying of three people linked to the U.S. consulate. The heavily tattooed Barrio Azteca gang members have long operated across the border in El Paso, dealing drugs and stealing cars. But in Juarez, the organization now specializes in contract killing for the Juarez drug cartel. According to U.S. law enforcement officers, it may have been involved in as many as half of the 2,660 killings in the city of the past year. Damn. Officials on both sides of the border have watched as the Aztecas hone their ability to locate targets, stalk them, and finally strike in brazen ambushes involving multiple car chases, coded radio communications, coordinated blocking maneuvers, and disciplined firepower by masked gunmen in body armor. Afterward, the assassins vanished back to safe houses in the Juarez Barrios or across the bridge into El Paso, Texas. Within their business of killing, they have surveillance people, intel people, and shooters. They have a degree of spe specialization, said David Cuthbertson, the special agent in charge of the FBI's El Paso division. They work day in, day out with a list of people to kill, and they get proficient at it. The special agent in charge of drug administration in El Paso, Joseph Arabet, said, our intelligence indicates they kill frequently for $100. The mayor of Juarez, Jose Reyes Vadis, said the city is honeycombed with safe houses, armories, and garages with stolen cars for the assassins to use. The mayor received a death threat recently in a note left beside a pig's head in the city. Arabit said investigators have no evidence to suggest the Barrio Azteca gang includes former military personnel or police. It is, however, working for the Juarez cartel, which includes La Línea, an enforcement element composed in part of former Juarez police officers and according to Mexican officials. This has been some form, there has been some form of training going on, said an anti-gang detective with the El Paso Sheriff's Department, who spoke on condition of anonymity because of the nature of his work. I don't know who and I don't know where, but how else would you explain how they operate? March 13th, Leslie Enrique Rodelfs, 35, who worked for the U.S. Consulate in Juarez and her husband, Arthur Redelps, 34, a deputy in the El Paso Sheriff's Department and a detention officer at the county jail, were returning home to El Paso from a children's party sponsored by the U.S. Consulate in Juarez. As their white sports utility vehicle neared the International Bridge that sunny Sunday afternoon, they were attacked by gunmen in at least two chase cars. When police arrived, they found the couple dead in their vehicle and their infant daughter wailing in the car seat. The intersection was littered with casings from an AK-47 assault rifle as well as 9mm guns. Ten mm. minutes before they were killed, Jorge Alberto Cencieros Salcido, 37, a supervisor at Juarez Assembly Plant, whose wife, Hilda Jimenez, also works for the U.S. Consulate, was attacked and slain in a similar style. He had just left the same party and was also driving a white SUV with his children in the car. According to intelligence gathered in Juarez and El Paso, Texas, U.S., investigators were quick to suspect the Barrio Azteca gang in connection with what President Obama has called the brutal murders. What was unclear, they said, was the motive. U.S. diplomats and agents have declined to describe the killings as targeted confrontations with the U.S. government, which had been pushing to place the U.S. drug intelligence officers in a Juarez police headquarters to more quickly pass along leads. 
five days after these counseling killings, the DEA unleashed an El Paso multi-agency gang sweep called Operation Knockdown to gather intelligence from Barrios Teca members. Over four days, officers questioned 363 people, including about 200 confirmed gang members or their associates. They also made 26 felony arrests. Soon after, the Department of Homeland Security issued a warning to the Barrio Steca gang that the Barrio Steca gang had given a green light to the retaliatory killing of a U.S. law enforcement list of officers. Authorities were especially interested in Eduardo Ravello, a captain of the Barrio Steca enterprise allegedly responsible for operations in Juarez. In October, the FBI had placed Ravello and his mugshot on its 10 most wanted list. And although they warned Ravello may have had plastic surgery and altered his fingerprints, he is still at large. DEA agents say 27 Barrio Steca members were detained as they tried to cross from El Paso to Juarez during Operation Knockdown. Evidence of gang members' fluid movement between these two countries. This week, authorities announced Mexican soldiers using information from the FBI and other sources had arrested Ricardo Baez de la Rosa, an Azteca sergeant in Juarez. Baez's confession was obtained at a military base where he was allegedly beaten, according to his attorney, a public defender. He has not been charged in the council of killings, though he was charged with killing rival gang members, including members of an enterprise known as the Artistic Assassins, or Double A's, who operate as contract killers for the Sinaloa cartel. Sinaloa is buying for control of the billion dollar drug trafficking routes through what is El Paso Corridor. In his statements, Baez says he was told through a chain of letters and phone calls from Mario Steca leaders in the El Paso County Jail and their associate gang leaders that they wanted Reldoffs, the El Paso Sheriff's deputy, killed because of his treatment of the Steca members in jail and his alleged threats against him. Baez said he tracked down Reldoffs at the children's party and then handed off the hit to others. He said the killing of the factory supervisor was a mistake because he was driving a white SUV similar to that of their target. El Paso County Sheriff Richard Wells said in a statement that Baez was a career criminal and denied Reldoff had mistreated inmates. Wiles stressed the motives remain unknown. These dudes, bro, I, I did not know much about the body of Stecker, right? These dudes are with that. They're with it, bro. Most definitely, bro. They're about they're about that action. They seem organized. They seem structured. I I didn't know this much about them, bro. But it, it it's is. you know what I'm saying that's a very good article, bro. And you know what, bro? Which was very interesting to me, right? What I, what I caught from this was they were a group that was founded in the Texas penal system, right? But they were able to branch off and establish regions on the other side of the border. That I find kind of kind of interesting. Yeah, I've always known that they had a very, very, very strong relationship with the cartels in Mexico, and they got their hands in a whole lot of, you know, all the all the routes in between Mexico and the U.S. in which, you know, substances are brought in or out of. They got their hand in damn near all of them, all the way from Matamoros, which is at the Gulf of Mexico, all the way to what is at the end of Texas, you know, and I guess in the southern New Mexico as well. But, uh, yeah, I didn't know. I didn't. Man, I didn't know they were responsible for all that carnage, <laughs> you know? They're not. They're definitely not messing around. I mean, just it just goes to show you, Brian, like, they started basically off the oppression from, from the Texas syndicate and Texas MA, Mexican, Texas Mexi Mexican MA, right? They started off that the threat of oppression, so they wanted to establish their own rackets, right? And in the beginning, the TS and the, and the Mexican MA outnumbered them. But they, they failed to put their, their foot on their neck. You know what I'm saying? Which allowed them to grow and grow and grow, man. And, and now they just, they're out number, uh, outnumbering both groups, bro. I kind of find it kind of interesting that Texas has so many different groups, man. Like, besides, like, they have the Tri-City Bombers, Barrio Azteca. They have uh, the Tango Blast. They have the Texas Syndicate. They have the Texas Emmy. And I think they have a couple other groups that are a little bit smaller. Like, I know they have the, the dudes out there in, in, in San Antonio, right? Yeah. That's, that has to be... Yeah, that got to be a crazy system, bro, for that to even operate. Like, because all you really got, well, and then they have the Bices, the Border Brothers. You know what I'm saying? In the system. I mean, California, all you got to really worry about is Norteños, Sureños, Bices. That's it. You know, you. I mean, you have the Bulldogs, but they're separated from everybody. And then you have all these new, uh, uh, 
Imagine if these groups start to create any S and Y gangs. I wonder if Texas has has caught up on that, bro, or not. They don't. They don't have the S and Y type of facilities like California does. Okay. You know. So yeah, the that's a lot of different organizations all operating in and out of the same prisons and shit. You know. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's going to be certain county jails like Austin's county jail is probably pretty much on lock, or excuse me, San Antonio's. El Paso's on lock with the Estecas. Houston's going to be on lock with the Tongos. But uh, inside the state prisons, man, they, you know, it's just like California. They'll send you anywhere. And they're going to all be together on these different little spots and shit, you know? But, but they, I mean, since they signed the manifesto, it seems like they're able to cooperate um, in the feds and in, in the uh, Texas Department of Corrections. It seems like the only ones that are not able to operate, man, which... I think we talked about them a little bit. Is a Tango Blast, and yeah, they're they, the they do whatever they're the deep, they want to do. They're the deepest ones in the system now, huh? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I wonder the deepest. So, I mean, I wonder how that that affects their operations, though, because it, like from from listening to this article, it seems like each one of these factions have some type of relationship with those groups across the border. You get what I'm saying? Now, if if these dudes are rejecting the system, and they're not structurally organized. How is that going to affect their criminal uh, dealings out there in the streets? Because say, say if I'm one of these big groups across the border, which are very highly structured, they have hierarchies, they have a chain of command, believe it or not. They have their rules, they have their regulations, they have their set procedures. I wouldn't want to deal with any loose cannons out there in the streets that could just do what they want or, or you know what I mean, or have that kind of, kind of division out there. I kind of would want to deal with people that are kind of structured yeah. as opposed to people who may be loose. So I'm just wondering how that works. Like as far as the, I mean, you got you got a lot of organizations right there that are dealing with organizations across across the border. I mean, how how do they make that coexist? Is my question. You know what I mean? As you can see, they already say they're they're at war with the New Mexico Sindicato, right? Over over territorial rights. It seems like that right there is is because basically it's all territorial stuff. It's like it get, to me what I'm hearing is they align with this group across the border. And whoever is not aligned with this group across the border that associates them, if you're part of this subgroup, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna mess with you. It's almost like they're, far, it's almost like they're farm teams for those Mexican nationalist organizations. Yeah, no, they're, they're, they're ingrained, bro. They see, the, man, when I, even when I was there, bro, in, in long ago, man, my first trip to Texas. There was all I ever heard of was the Texas Syndicate. There were other groups around, you know what I mean? But then, man, if, if just just like the Serene, we've talked about it before, like with the North and South thing, whoever controls that border has a slight advantage. You know what I mean? They're gonna build them relationships. They're gonna have first access at product with with Mexico, you know, with cartels. Same in Texas, man. Barrio Azteca, Tri City Bombers. That's their border. You know what I mean? So that's going to happen. Man, money, money makes more power where there might not be without the money. You know, you control 15, 20 different entry points, tunnels, whatever, you know, crossings. And money makes power, bro. You know, where, where one group might have quadruple the members, and you got quadruple the power, man, because you can make things happen because your bank account's a lot bigger. Yeah. You know? The only thing I question is, is the intel as far as the, um, um, why they had that deputy killed in, in those those uh, people that were part of, what were those people part of the, what were they part of? They got, like, who were those people that got whacked coming across the border? There was the El Paso Sheriff and who else? Uh, some consulate people. And then there was just some regular factory worker that was uh, an accident. I'm, I'm just kind of curious if, if those were the real reasons why they took that dude out, man. Or if that's falsified intelligence, because it kind of seems like, I mean, it kind of seems like to me, like, you know, we know these groups aren't stupid. You get what I'm saying? So they know doing that would cause a lot of heat and a lot of attention. So in order to make that move, I would have to think that there was something kind of a little bit more to it than what we know. I'm just speculating. I agree. You know I agree. You never know, bro. Hey, if you, you just, hey, you got, hey. Man, you disrespect the wrong dude. They don't care who you are. 
especially the cartel. The, them barrios, they could do is they're like cartel dudes, bro. They're not like yeah. Nortenos or fucking Tongos. They're they're their own crazy shit, bro. They're not messing around. They disrespect the wrong dude. He's like, take him out. They're taking him out. They don't care if he's the yeah. sheriff, the governor. They don't care. They'll deal with those ramifications. You know, they're just willing to go that far. They're not playing. They're different. They're 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 real killers, bro. They're it's yeah. all skips and cornies in their whole group, bro. It's just skips and cornies. Yeah, I think they're I think to be honest with you, I think they're more with it than that, bro. They're over there doing they are. 20, they're not playing around. They're doing, they're doing 20 man hits and stuff. These ain't no yeah. little movidas, bro. These hey, are like hey, hey, they're they're some of the main ones out there taking people, taking this off of people, you know what I mean, and leaving people scattered and all that. They're 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 out there doing that kind of stuff, bro. They're not messing around, man. They're nobody you want to be on their bad side. Maybe in prison, you know, where there's not so much access to chainsaws and AKs and stuff. They're equal, but on the streets, they're, they're okay. That's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. It seemed like to me, like from hearing the article, their history started here. Those tactics are more across the border. So it seems like they were able to evolve and recruit across the border. And they just became something totally different than what they first established. You know what I mean, I may be wrong. Am I thinking about it? But um, it seems logical, though. You know what I'm saying? Like, cause, cause they started in the, in the penal system. I don't see the TS being able to migrate across the border. I'm pretty sure there's a few members that are across the border that got deported from the TS and the Texas, Texas Mexican Mafia, but you don't hear about them having strong footholds in in Juarez. Juarez is like man cartel capital, bro. There's so much activity going on out there, so much stuff going on with the federales, so much corruption. So for them to have a foothold in that city, goes to tell me how much power and influence they have on that border. No doubt. Yeah, they're not messing around. They're a different breed, dude. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't know that they were involved to the extent that they are, but I already knew without reading this that they're different. You know what I mean? But, yeah, Texas Texas is a whole different animal. They're, they're on a different page, man, and that's all there is to it. You know, TS is more traditional, like a, you know, they're more closer to like us and the Southerners, bro. They're a traditional old school. Well, because they started, they, they were like, the, what was it? The, 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 what were they called? The EP, EPT, El Paso tipped, El Paso tip. Like they were basically called tipped up. You know what I'm saying? So they started in California. So they took the California politics with them. You know what I mean? And were able, when, when a couple of them got uh, extra, extradited over there, that's how the TS was able to form because before that in the seventies, they really didn't have too many organized groups. I'm sure there was a few, but I don't have the historical knowledge of those groups. So yeah, like you said, they're more California based. And even that, the, the, uh, I can't really speak too much on the Texas Mexican mafia. I don't know as far as the historical regions, that's something that we need to look into, but man, um, these dudes are definitely with it, bro. I was kind of like, wow, I was taking it back. I mean, I, you're hearing about 20 people getting whacked at a time, bro. 18 over here, 20 over here. You know what I mean? They, they're having a conflict with their leadership, so eight of them get whacked. Man, that ain't playing around, too. bro. You know, huh? Rip, too, is uh, Happy and Bird are, are real good friends with them body was takers in federal prison right now. So that might be a whole different alliance, you know, as far as them guys go. Yeah, that's true. Cause they're they're down there, buddy, buddy, with the body of stickers. The guys, the guys aren't dumb, bro. They they know who to talk to. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, here's today's lesson, though. Don't mess around with the cartels and prison gangs, and especially them damn barrio stickers. And you won't be one of them people with your head off of your shoulders. <laughs> real easy. You know what? I'm not trying to laugh. That's that's a real message right there. Walk bro. around. And Put your head on still and handle your business. It's your boy Rojo, man. Body Azteca. Stay away from them guys. They're with the business. Have a good day. We'll holler at you later.